Good early morning. Roosters crowing, sun's rising. This is my favorite time of day. Never in a million years did I think I would ever enjoy waking up early. Um, but it has become just my favorite time of day. Now, I don't have to get up this early to milk the cow. A lot of people milk later in the day after breakfast. Some even feed some of the animals and then milk. Um, but I have just discovered that this works best for us, especially during school, to be able to get up and have the cows milked before the kids are up. And this time of year, it's the only time of day that it's not a million degrees outside here in Texas. So I get up and I brew my coffee and I come out and I milk while the sun is rising and it's just the best. It's everything um, that I could dream of farm life being. I actually have my cows way back behind my house right now because we're working on rotational grazing, which I will tell you about. Uh, but I actually have to go get one of them, so I'll be right back. So, I've got my bestie girl in the stanchion. I'm gonna clean up her udders and get some milk in her first. So, rotational grazing. We are working on getting our animals all rotationally grazing. We actually, um, my husband just got a bonus check from work and we used part of it to get some more Premier One um, fencing. Now, he actually hasn't ordered it yet. He's going to call and talk to them because we want to know if we can run more than one netting off of a, one charger because I seem to recall you can. They're made to go together like they have connectors. So we're hoping to run two off of one charger because it would be significantly cheaper to just buy one charger. Um, but we also are going to run them right next to each other anyway. So the goal is to have our sheep and sheep and goats um, running side by side, boys, girls, and then in the netting, and then use our like single wire. It's like multiple strands, but one wire, it's not a netting, um, to go around the cows and get everybody rotating on the back of our property. So we have a little over 10 acres, like 10.26 or something like that. And we really only have been utilizing the front probably third. Um, now there is a lot of like kind of forest and overgrown areas in the back, but that's perfect for sheep and goats, especially goats. Um, there's this one place where it's just like a grove of poison ivy, so the goats are going to love that. Um, our end goal, what we really want to do is have the whole property done with field fence so that we can have a couple of our Great Pyrenees like just patrolling the whole property. But because of the nature of Great Pyrenees to want to roam, oh, <laughs> I have a little honeybee. He might fly in front of the camera. He's checking it out. Um, I should say she, most honeybees are girls. Oh, here it is. Hello, little friend. Um, anyway. So, why rotational grazing? So we've known rotational grazing for a long time. We've been watching Justin Rhodes a long time and Joel Salton. Um, rotational grazing is good for your field. We've learned that, we've heard that for a couple of years now. We just haven't had the infrastructure to do it. Um, this spring we started with our one, we, we do have one fence that is a Gallagher fence. Um, that is on a reel and you roll it up um, which is really convenient except for when it breaks and you have to tie it back together and then it won't roll into the thing. Um, so it has gotten to where it's really difficult to move um, but it is because the wire was broken at one point. Um, so it's like 330 feet or 350 feet something like that. Um, so my loud ducks are here, so I hope that you can hear me over them. 
some of these ducks are going to a new farm soon. Can't say I'm sad. Um, our ducks hid nest and hatch way more ducks than I wanted because we don't have a pond yet. And we are going to have a pond. Um, our neighbor actually is going to do this one. Um, but we do not yet, and so these ducks just like walk around being loud. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so rotational grazing, number one for especially for animals like sheep and goats is really good for them as far as parasites um, because when they're in one place for too long is when you tend to start having parasite problems and having to warm your goats and your sheep. Um, if you're rotationally grazing them, it pretty much negates the need for deworming. Um, don't get stuffy. So, that's part of the reason. Another part of the reason is to clear underbrush um, for goats, especially sheep do some, but goats, I mean, goats will eat anything they can reach, except for like this pokeweed that grows in the fields. No one will eat that. And then there's another one called goatweed that oddly enough, the goats won't eat. But anyway, um, so those are two reasons, but the main reason that I am feeling such an urgency um, to start rotational grazing is soil health. Now, I'm sure that many of you know, if you're not in Texas, even have probably know this, but Texas, at least the part of Texas I'm in, probably most of Texas, is in a pretty significant drought. Um, I couldn't tell you right now how many days it's been since we had rain of any significance. Um, like we have a 24% chance of rain on Saturday and I'm just like, please, 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 please. Um, because it's so dry. Everything is turning brown. I mean, you can see the grass behind me. It's not green. Um, maybe a little bit green, but this is also the area where it gets water because we rent out, um, water bowls here and whatnot. So we actually spray water here and rinsing things out so we really need some rain um so in that we're having to buy hay and we normally do not buy hay in june in july but there's nothing left in the pastures for them to eat um there's a hay shortage because we are obviously not the only people having this problem um, we went to get hay recently and all they had was this giant block of alfalfa that, um, it actually filled up our whole little trailer, but it cost a fortune. <laughs> um, so we, we need to move them to where there's more things to eat, even though those things to eat are probably going to be fairly dry. They're still eating it. Um, but the thing with soil health if you are building your soil if you have healthy soil it is more drought resistant because it soaks in the water that it does get so right now um when i've been moving portable fences and such i've been taking a bucket of water to try to pour where i'm pulling up a t-post or putting in a t-post to attempt to soften the ground and it doesn't soak in it just like runs off it it really um we've really had a hard time with it our water just doesn't soak in because our soil is not healthy um and so we're we're trying to work on that so by rotationally grazing them you leave living roots in the ground whereas <coughs> whereas if they are in the same place for too long they'll eat it all down to little nubs and it has a hard time growing back and is not alive so living roots in the ground help keep your soil alive and not hard and dusty. Um, obviously we don't spray, we don't spray anything here. Um, you know, soil health started going downhill when in, industrial farmers started spraying pesticides and there was a big push for that's how you farm and 
um, things got separated, like you're either a cattle farmer or a vegetable farmer, you can't be both, or you know, you're a chicken farmer or a corn farmer. Um, and so with less integration of all the different aspects of farming, it has caused us to be losing soil health and losing soil. Um, at this point, I wouldn't even call what we have soil, I would call it dirt. Um, so we were trying to build soil everywhere, not just in our garden. Obviously, we started in the garden, um, but the more we're learning about soil health and the importance, not just for us growing things to feed our animals, but for the planet, because plants through photosynthesis, whatever plants they are, grass, hay, poison ivy, um, through photosynthesis, take carbon out of the um, air atmosphere and hold it in the soil. Okay, well, part of the reason that we're having, you know, such problems with carbon is that, at least in the United States, we've killed all the soil. Um, and so that is, that is the main reason that we're wanting to rotationally graze. So we're working on that. I actually have to move the sheep later today. Um, I was getting post set last night to do that so that I could do it quickly this morning before it got terribly hot. Um, and I guess I forgot to turn their fence back on. I don't remember turning it off, but the sheep got out. And when I went to get the cows, the sheep were in with the cows and had knocked the fence down. So i um, thinking the board that they were all all the animals were still back there. I mean, they were probably still back there because it's a new paddock and there was stuff to eat. So, um, but I got to get that dealt with early this morning. Um, so we'll be doing that first thing. Um, also while I'm milking, wanted to touch base with our plan with the calves. So we are working on, um, we should have already gotten this done. We ordered it like a month ago, but life has been a little crazy. Um, but we're getting DNA testing done on Stacy to see if she is at least 98% Jersey. Um, and if she is, then her little bull calf will be um, able to be registered as a Belfair. And so the plan with him is to sell him. So a Belfair is a Jersey Irish Dexter cross, a really great dual purpose cow. Um, so if, if that in fact works out, which we think she is, um, the people we bought her from think she is, we will, um, be able to sell him as a Belfair. Now Bessie girl's calf will fill the freezer. <laughs> um, her last calf who we called Belle, she went to the butcher in March at about 18 months old and we got our for our blah, blah, blah. and we filled our freezers really well so hopefully that will last us until um well, I don't know if it'll last us a year and a half there's eight of us I mean the ground beef won't <laughs> but maybe the roast and steak and stuff will we'll see um we do eat a lot of venison in the, during hunting season and right after um, because Thomas will usually go hunt and get at least a deer and then we have sweet friends who love to hunt but don't have um, kids at home anymore and don't go through as much meat but <laughs> they give us meat so we usually kind of will mix those interchangeably ground beef and ground venison. On my docket today after um, after moving the sheep, I am going to be making some mozzarella. Ooh, oh, I spilled milk on myself. All right, so Bessie here is about done, and I'm going to go get Stacy. Once I get her milk, so I'll go in and deal with the milk, and then come back out and deal with the sheep. <laughs> Now I have Miss Stacy here. 
<laughs> Stacy is our newer cow. She does not give as much milk as Bessie. This is her first time to calf them. So I don't know, maybe it'll get better with time. Um, but her bag, is, let me show you. See, she doesn't even, you know, Bessie like hangs down to like here. So she, her bag is much smaller. So hopefully that'll get better with time, but she still gives us good milk. Um, calf sharing, I get maybe a gallon a day, probably slightly less actually. Um, but we happen to know she is A2A2, the farm that we bought her from. Just testing for that. So we thought that was kind of exciting. Um, none of us have a problem with beta casein, um, but it's good to know. And so we actually, I mean, okay, let me say, I don't know. I don't know if any of us have a problem with that. Ada might actually. So Bessie, we don't know. And we actually, that is one of the testing that we're going to do when we send off all this testing um, to UC Davis is we're getting Bessie tested to see. And I'll be really curious because Ada, our 13 year old daughter, has for a long time had tummy troubles and had gotten a stomach ache when she has eaten dairy. So we have pizza in the movie night every Friday. Every Friday she would get a stomach ache. Well, then we moved out here and got a cow and started having raw milk and the problem went away. Um, now she's not a huge milk drinker. She'll use yogurt and smoothie. Um, so it's mainly cheese for her that she eats and ice cream. Um, but now when we have pizza and movie night, as long as it's mozzarella I've made with our milk, she doesn't have a problem. If we've had a crazy day, like when I make pizza, I start at four o'clock because I do the crust, I do the sauce, I do the cheese. Like it takes, it's time consuming, but it's so worth it, it's delicious. Um, but if we've had a busy day, I've had an appointment or whatever, and I have to buy, take a big pizza instead, she gets a stomach ache. So, you know, there's something about it. I don't know if it's raw versus pasteurized. It very well could be, but now that I think about it, maybe Bessie's A2A2 as well, and that helps Ada. Stacy, she flicks me with her tail way more than Bessie does. <clears throat> so, um, there are a lot of diets out there, like elimination. There's so many food elimination diets now because everybody has problems with, oh, this food is inflammatory or this food's inflammatory, and You'll never make me believe that raw dairy products are bad for you. Um, that and, and I don't think all bread is bad for you and I'll tell you about that in a minute, but um, I am trying, my goal is to only have dairy products that I make from our raw milk. So the thing with dairy is Obviously, grocery stores do not sell raw milk. Raw milk is very expensive to get. Um, I mean, I know people drive an hour to pay $12 a gallon for raw milk. And that's here in Texas. Like, there are other places where it may be even more than that. Um, now, I know Full Quiver in Kemp, Texas, I believe sells it for $7 a gallon. Um, but you have to drive out there. Well, they do have some sort of delivery service now. Um, because their licensing allows it, but I cannot sell raw milk for human consumption. It is illegal, um, but quite frankly, we use it all anyway. Um, and what we don't drink, we use to fatten up pigs when we have feed our pigs. Um, it makes for really good meat. But anyway, um, when you buy dairy products at the grocery store, they have gone through homogenization and pasteurization. Um, pasteurizing, which I just read this, I'm reading um, Joel Salatin's Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, and it's talking about why we started pasteurizing milk as a country. Ooh. Hold on, Stace. Um, and it talks about why we started pasteurizing milk 
as a country. Okay, all of this bacteria that they're worried about did not start <clears throat> until the Industrial Revolution when we started spraying pesticides on everything and started separating the farm into factions where you're either a dairy farmer or you're a corn farmer or you're a chicken farmer or you're a beef cow farmer. When, when all that got separated and are not working together as they should, um, and cows were thrown in more confinement farming um, situations, and then, you know, hooked up to milk machines with all this long tubing that is difficult to clean, because how do you clean a really long straw? <laughs> um, that is when all the bacteria started showing up in milk. And that is when people started having, I mean, that's really when like salmonella showed up and all that kind of thing. So, um, we had to start pasteurizing for stores because of that. But when you pasteurize milk, it kills all the bad bacteria, but it also kills the good bacteria. And the good bacteria in milk is what your gut needs to process the lactose in milk. Um, so raw milk is very rich in vitamins and nutrients, calcium, um, and things that are good for your gut, good bacteria. But when it is pasteurized out, it makes milk really difficult to process. So that is why a lot of people have trouble with milk. Um, and the other, the other thing that you'll never make me believe is bad for you is all bread, especially sourdough bread. So for years, I've been making our sandwich bread from scratch, even before I did sourdough, um, because our oldest son had a lot of intestinal problems when he was little. And, you know, the Lord just put the right people in my life at the time. Um, so I had a couple of friends that were dietitians that taught me how to read labels and what not to buy. Um, the, the short version of that is the more ingredients, and especially the more ingredients that you can't pronounce, you shouldn't buy it. Um, also anything that says enriched bleached, or really enriched. Um, so I started making bread from scratch. I actually um, also had uh, a friend at church at the time that taught bread making classes. She actually um, is the one that made my mug here. They have a bed and breakfast in Alaska now. It's called, well, the, I don't know what the bed and breakfast is called. I'll have to look it up. But her mugs are Mustard Mountain. And they're so pretty. And I will try to put a link in the description. Anyway, she taught me how to make bread. Okay, and I use really good non-GMO wheat that I order. I use flaxseed in it and oats in it. Um, it's high in fiber. I don't use sugar. I use honey. Um, so it's drastically better than their grocery store bread. When even if you read the packages for whole wheat bread, like there's high fructose corn syrup in some of it. Like what do you need that for? <coughs> anyway, so that bread, I believe is way better for you. Um, but then it still does have, um, some dough conditioner in it and it has, um, yeast that you buy in the little packets. I mean, I buy it in a ginormous packet because I make a lot of bread, um, which is fine for most people. Okay. But there are some people who cannot have gluten products. Okay. So. You know, I didn't start hearing about gluten intolerance until I was an adult, and I think that it's become way more common now. Um, and I recently saw this thing about how people who in the United States are gluten intolerant and lactose intolerant go to Europe and eat all the cheesy pasta they want and don't get sick. Um, and that's crazy. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that other countries regulate their food way better than we do in the United States. There are a lot of foods that are legal here that are not in other countries. I mean, common foods like 
um, different sodas and chips and whatnot. Uh, I actually saw a list recently and was like really shocked at some of the stuff that is so commonplace here and is illegal in other countries because it is so bad for you. Um, but I did hear that our FDA is, is possibly changing on some of that. So we'll see. I don't know how they're going to do it though. Cause these are big companies. Um, it's going to be interesting <clears throat> if it actually happens. Even if you are gluten intolerant, a lot of people that are gluten intolerant can eat sourdough products because of the nature of sourdough. And when I say, like, I'll, you'll never make me believe all bread is bad for you because Jesus ate bread, and so I feel like I can too. Well, Jesus didn't go buy, Jesus' mama didn't go buy yeast at the store. They did, everything they made was sourdough. It was a active yeast starter, um, which is, you know, we call sourdough now. You can make so many different things with sourdough. Because of the nature of how sourdough works, it actually breaks down the gluten in the bread. So, whereas you can't call it gluten-free because it has wheat in it, um, the gluten is broken down so that you can digest it better. Um, so this is how we used to make bread. That, this is how bread used to be made. Uh, so that's, in my opinion, why gluten intolerance is such a thing now. Um, <clears throat> whereas, you know, a hundred years ago it wasn't because a hundred years ago we made bread a lot differently. So you'll never make me believe that sourdough is bad for you. Sourdough has, is really good for your gut. Sourdough is really good for your gut. Um, because of, of the fermentation process that it goes through. And you can make so much with sourdough, right? So I make our normal sourdough loaves. Um, but you can also make a sourdough sandwich bread that doesn't have quite that sourdoughy taste because some people don't like that. I think it's amazing, um, but some people don't like that. And you can make, actually right now I have some dough rising to make tortillas because Ada wants to make, Ada loves to cook and she wanted to make these fancy tacos tonight. And she wanted homemade tortillas. And normally <clears throat> we get homemade tortillas from my neighbor Perla because she makes the best tortillas. <clears throat> but she's been a little overwhelmed with tortilla making lately because everybody wants her tortillas and they're getting ready to go out of town. So I didn't want to ask her for any. <clears throat> and I've been really wanting to try these sourdough ones too. So we'll try that tonight. We can make sourdough pancakes, sourdough waffles. Last week I made sourdough buttermilk biscuits. Um, there's so many options and it's much easier to process and has stuff that's good for your gut. So, I'm very excited about that. And the other thing that I'm going to do today is when I make mozzarella, I'm going to try pouring it into a soap mold. So I make goat milk soap, so I have these rectangular soap molds. While it's still hot, I'm going to try to put it into the soap mold to see if I can get it to harden like a block so that I can slice it for cheese for sandwiches. Um, because I love a grilled cheese with jalapenos on sourdough. Oh my gosh. But because I'm trying to not eat cheese from the store, I need to sandwich cheese. So we'll see how that goes. And maybe I'll make a video about that too. But about to finish up here and take Miss Stacy back to her baby. Should we go see baby? Sunrise. It's so bright on the camera. All right, cows are milked. Heading in to deal with that and start the rest of my day. Happy homesteading. <laughs>